Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil while we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church. We need your power in us. Welcome to our service on this, the 13th Sunday after Trinity. Our theme today is God's anti-bullying policy, protecting the humble. And in a moment, Hugh Allen will lead us in our opening prayers and confession. But before then, the Morell family will lead us as we sing, We Are Marching. Thank you. 
Bishop Peter Morris, who was our Bishop of Taunton, said this. Christians have car stickers and catchphrases. Believers have creeds and promises. Disciples have scars and stories. Despite the scars, disciples have a joy in their hearts and a sense of wonder. It is the same for our Lord. Jesus was not immune to the threat of arrest and torture. Neither was he acceptable to many in authority. He experienced grief and loss. But he also experienced glory, as in the transfiguration. He bridged the gap between the incredible glory of God and the struggle in our own lives. This closing of the gap is there for us. Like the Big Bang, to see this glory is way beyond most of us. Ezekiel and Isaiah and others have had glimpses. We too, though, may on occasion experience wonder and joy. O oh Lord God, enable us, we pray, to lay aside our anxieties as we come to you in worship. Grant us even a glimpse of your incredible glory and the determination to follow you through Jesus Christ, as did your disciples. Enrich our lives with your spirit of love, joy and peace, that we might reflect this to our neighbour. Amen. Now, the trouble is that stuff gets in the way. We may not feel worthy. We may be carrying a feeling of guilt. We may be falling short of God's will for us. Yet, through our Lord, we can be set once again on the way that leads to life in its fullness. We keep some moments of quiet. Let's say this prayer of confession together. Lord, I come to you. Let my heart be changed, renewed, flowing from the grace that I've found in you. And Lord, I've come to know the weaknesses I see in me will be stripped away by the power of your love. Lord, unveil my eyes. Let me see you face to face the knowledge of your love as you live in me. Lord, renew my mind as your will unfolds in my life, in living every day in the power of your love. Amen. Pour down upon us from heaven the rich blessing of your forgiveness. Grant to us, O Saviour of glory, the fear of God, the love of God, and the will of God to do on earth at all times as angels and saints do in heaven. Amen. May the glory of God be ever before us. Amen. Now I am handing over to Richard Adams who will explain where, as a Christian, he sees grounds for hope in today's world. Richard. Thank you very much, Hugh, for opening our service. Now I'm going to welcome Sarah Jackson, who is going to be giving us her thoughts of how, as a Christian, she finds grounds for hope in the world today and then the Benson family will lead us in singing our second song, which will be Before I Spoke a Word. So, over to Sarah. Where do I find hope in the world today? With all that is happening in the world, with the pandemic, political and racial tensions, you can understand why it seems hard to find hope, and where do we look to find hope? I have recently been reading through Ruth and Esther in my Bible reading notes. In both cases, their situation looked bleak, but, as the account unfolds, 
we see that God had been quietly putting all things in place. If we lift our eyes to God and do his will, he will lead us through these difficult, trying and troubling times. This gives me hope. It's so easy to get hung up on the little problems which then seem insurmountable. However, if we take a breath and lift our eyes up, we can see all the wonderful gifts which God has given us. Driving home from Taunton the other day, it felt like a breath of fresh air and like normal to see the hay bales in the fields on the way into Whitby. Hearing the bird song we've not noticed before, having the conversation with po folks we may not have spoken to before because due to Covid we have had this enforced slowing down. This has made me more aware and appreciative and given me hope and encouragement. Like a great painting, if we only focus on one area, we miss the beauty in the whole. If we limit where we seek hope and encouragement, we will miss all that God is offering us in all the small things. I have found that in noticing and appreciating the small things, my hope and appreciation has increased. And now for the second hymn, Before I Spoke a Word.
If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. That passage is quite a unique one in the Gospels. It's one of the only times when the issue of church discipline is dealt with. And while it's quite clear what it is in general, it is basically a grievance procedure. If one person thinks that another person in the church uh, is sinning against them, what should they do? But beyond that, there doesn't seem to be much detail particularly on the issue of what sort of sin. What are we talking about here? There are loads of different sorts of sins, some extremely serious, some completely trivial. What are we talking about? Well, to get a bit more detail, we have to go into the context and we have to go back to the beginning and see just how this passage has evolved from what's gone before. So let's go back to the end of chapter 17 where Jesus is put on the spot by some Pharisees who say to him, OK, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And it brings up the whole issue of what we owe to God in terms of our obedience and our loyalty compared with what we owe to Caesar, like, in other words, should we follow the government's uh, rules um, regardless of whether they impinge upon our Christian faith or not. Jesus deals with that and he makes it quite clear that we are to make sure that we honour God by living obediently towards him, but also where uh, the government has a reasonable claim on our obedience, we are to do as the government directs as well. But God comes first. The disciples have come back to him and say, OK, we get the idea about uh, the government uh, has to be obeyed on some things. But when it comes to obeying God, well, when it comes to God's kingdom, when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And that is what chapter 18 deals with. And it is very important to see how Jesus follows this train of thinking through because he says the greatest in the kingdom of heaven is like a little child and he sets before them a child and says you must become like one of these little ones and in particular he specifies you must humble yourselves to become like one of these humble ones and humility comes to the fore as one of the key virtues as far as Jesus is concerned. Now when we look forward to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8 we see St Paul making the point that Jesus is actually the role model when it comes to humility. St Paul tells us that he emptied himself and became like a servant for us and he humbled himself even to death on a cross. So therefore to become great in the kingdom of God is to become as much like Jesus as it's possible to become particularly in the area of humility. 
Now, as we all know, the world's understanding of humility often becomes a disparaging of weakness. It's very hard in the secular world to be humble, but also to be strong and to be courageous, because as far as they're concerned, people can walk over somebody who is humbled. So therefore, Jesus has some work to do here to establish that to be humble is in fact in God's sight to be great. So he then launches straight into some teaching about how important it is not to despise one of these little ones. And we start to get the idea that what Jesus has in mind here is something a bit like an anti-bullying policy. Just because somebody is humble and uh, doesn't rate themselves uh, highly in God's eyes or the eyes of other human beings, they're prepared to act as a servant. They are prepared to give way to other people on certain things. But that doesn't mean to say that therefore you have a right to push them around and certainly not to despise them. And this phrase, these little ones, starts to occur in chapter 18. Now he's not talking about people who are physically little or young in age. What he's getting at here, given that this is in Matthew's Gospel, which is written for a Jewish church, of Jewish converts, he's obviously now starting to deal with how the wider church should deal with people who are young in their faith, particularly if they've had to go through the great um, challenge of accepting that Jesus is the Messiah and that therefore they're having to recalibrate their whole understanding of what it means to live by God's law and how they don't have to aspire to live like Pharisees to nevertheless keep God's law of love as revealed and taught by Jesus in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. That is now the key to understanding the love of God and his law of love. And obviously, if they are growing in that sort of faith and they're still very young and they're still lacking in confidence and still finding their feet in this very different world, then if some older, more confident members of the church come and start pushing them around and saying, oh, you haven't learned anything yet, have you? And start being generally overbearing and insensitive, then what's going to happen is that they are going to lose what little faith they have and are going to start to move away from the church again. And that's why the next part of the teaching is Jesus giving Matthew's account of Jesus as the Good Shepherd coming to rescue the lost. And in this account of the parable, it's not those who are outside the fold of Judaism um, and the Gentiles, uh, it's far more to do with the fact that these lost lambs are young Christian converts who have actually been pushed out of their church by overbearing, insensitive, sinful behaviour by mature Christians who are old enough and wise enough to know better. And so therefore Jesus has to go after them and bring them back lovingly into the fold of people who should be looking after them. So when we then get to the passage that we've just uh, heard read, this is Jesus summarising how uh, we should be applying gospel principles to how we deal with people who are young and tender and lacking in confidence in their faith, but who have the ability to grow as disciples, provided that the more mature Christians love them as they should. 
And when it comes then to dealing with such people and pointing out to them the error of their ways, the issues that Jesus mentions are all issues which are mentioned later on in the letters of the New Testament, which are addressed to Christian congregations. And the issues that are dealt with is, number one, speak to the person who's offending, and speak in love. That's picking up on St Paul's teaching in Letter to the Ephesians, where he says we must speak the truth in love. That's chapter 4 and verse 15. And then, if the person doesn't listen, then bring two or three other Christians along and try and point out to the person the error of their ways. In other words, act together as the body of Christ. Don't try and do it alone. We have each other. And this is where an understanding of the body of Christ is absolutely central. We are not designed to live alone as Christians with just a relationship with God. We need each other as Christians also. And together we can do far more than we can do individually particularly in convincing somebody who has got the wrong understanding of Christian behaviour to actually persuade them that uh, they need to change their attitude um, and they need to stop sinning in God's sight. And that then leads to the fact that we need sometimes to have difficult words with fellow Christians to protect the whole body. If people are allowed to behave badly and irresponsibly towards other vulnerable, humble Christians, then to protect the integrity of the whole body of Christ, these people may need to be brought up a bit sharp and have the error of their ways pointed out to them, and if necessary, uh, excluded from the fellowship until they have repented. That's what Jesus is getting at, and that is a very good reminder to us about how important it is that we treat each other lovingly, sensitively, and justly as fellow Christians, and particularly to those who have recently come to faith, because that is how the Good Shepherd would have us treat each other and seek to keep them in the fold, not drifting off back into danger. And that point about humility was all summarised by St John the Baptist when he said at the end of his ministry, when he said of Jesus, he must increase in me, I must decrease. There is no room for ego in the life of a mature Christian. Lots to pray about here, so I'll hand over to Roger Wilson, who will lead us in prayer. Thank you, Martin. And now I lead you in our prayers. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to reply, hear our prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us when we pray in faith. Almighty God, we follow you as a person who we love and trust. Protect and guide us in this time of coronavirus, as we pray, Lord, that you can aid the sick, the vulnerable, and all those who need your assistance. Keep them safe and looked after and continue to maintain them as they need and would want. We pray for the needs of the world, especially all those very many countries engaged in civil unrest. In particular, we think of both the Ethiopian and Nigerian Christians who are suffering systematic persecution. Also in our prayers are the Christian churches of North Kivu in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, whom we support through the work of the Semeliki Trust. May all these countries eventually resolve their governments and conflicts 
and end up living peacefully with each other and their neighbours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen our bishops Peter and Ruth, our Archdeacon Simon and all your church in the service of Christ, that those who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love and reveal your glory in the world. In particular, Lord, we offer our thoughts for our Bishop Peter and pray that he recovers swiftly from his current medical treatment and return safely to his throne. Bless and guide Elizabeth our Queen, give wisdom to all in authority, and direct this and every nation in the ways of justice and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the united benefits of Wivelescombe and the Hills, for unity, love and fellowship. We pray that Martin will continue to bring our church family closer together to promote your work within our community and bring even more people closer to you. We pray for the well-being of all those who are about to return to Kingsmead and the primary school and their hopes for success both in school and in their future lives. We also pray for the older teenagers of our benefice who are facing uncertainties about how they will go back to college, university or future life. We think of the businesses and farmers of our benefice. At this particular time of the year we think of all the farmers finishing haymaking and preparing for the next season. We also remember all the community groups in our benefice and pray that they may continue to meet the needs of those they serve. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for the sick, and in particular for Jan Weaver undergoing treatment for cancer. Let us also pray for Pulsford Lodge and Langley House for their continuing safety and for their management and staff working such long hours. Also in our prayers are the home care staff who are often the lifeline for the lonely and isolated in our community. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles and bring them the joy of your salvation. We remember those who have recently died and all those either known to us or known only to God. We also pray for those who face the pain of grief whilst learning to adjust to a new life without a loved one. Help us to support all those who mourn both with our prayers and with neighbourly help this day and in the days, weeks and months to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And now I hand back to Martin for the notices. Thank you very much for leading us in prayer, Roger. Now, just a couple of notices before we sing our final hymn. Firstly, if you want to know what's going on in St Andrews and the Benefits and what's coming up in the near future, do remember that on our website you will find not only this service, but also our weekly notice sheet. So therefore, do please uh, keep yourselves informed of things that are coming up. 
um, you will particularly see, if you do so, you will see that we actually do have uh, some very interesting concerts coming up in the first weekend of October, when the Two Moors Festival are going to be running a series of three days of concerts, the Friday, the Saturday and the Sunday, um, and the concert repertoire of all three of those concerts will be repeated uh, during the day. So you get two chances to see and come and listen to the concerts for the simple reason that with distancing having to be uh, very carefully worked out, we can't get as many people into St Andrews um, as we otherwise would. So therefore uh, we're having on each day two concerts, identical uh, items on them, uh, but we're running them uh, three hours apart from each other so that we get a chance to admit as many people as we would normally for one concert. But it is at least a start of return to something like the normality that we are used to, and uh, it will be very good to be able to simply attend a concert for once. So we do hope that you will uh, have a look at the Two Moors uh, website and see if you'd like to come along for that. So let's now sing our final hymn which will be Guide Me O Thou Great Redeemer and then I'll lead us in the sharing of the blessing. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who walked this earth in humility, obscuring his kingship, confusing the arrogant, and hindering them from grasping his redeeming purpose, bless us with his gracious presence and fill us with his spirit of loving servanthood. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those for whom you pray this day, this coming week, and for evermore. Amen.